we can take care of birthdays right now. We had, we had, we had Les, Mallory had a birthday yesterday, right? That we're recounting, and I think Diane Nelson's birthday was yesterday, and Porter was last week, so let's see, we got Les, happy birthday, Porter and Les, we'll put you second, Les, all right? Okay, well, then. happy birthday, Porter, Carissa, and Les. There we go. Porter, Carissa, and Les. remembering this it's probably some kind of a psychological thing um, let me <laughs> let us talk about this coming week or actually the rest of the half next half the month um, first of all we will be collecting the Pentecost offering today as well as we did last Sunday uh, Pentecost however is next Sunday, but next Sunday we will be meeting at Concord for a joint service there and uh, be hearing about a couple of our members over at Concord and their work, their medical work in Guatemala. And uh, so that'll be next Sunday at 10 o'clock. And I've been saying it's a potluck, but it's not. So don't bring any pot. So. Well, it's, man, no, I'm not going to get, any, get into it. It's not a potluck. There will be a fellowship, but it's not a potluck. So just keep that in mind. Graduations. We need to have any information for any graduates you have in your family. It can be college, high school, whatever, whatever you want to recognize. But we need to have the information into the office by May 26th. And you can read that more carefully. She has all kinds of information there for you to to pre pre prepare for her if you have that much for it. Thanks for Porter. He plays today. We'll hear him later on during the service. Um, this, sat this Thursday, which is also the community dinner, you'll note, uh, this Thursday through Saturday out in Concord, the church in Concord is having an estate sale for the parsonage that they are preparing to sell. So if you are interested, it's 301 Hanover Street, and there's all kinds of interesting things in there that have been hidden for years. People probably don't even know they're there. But uh, 301 Hanover Street, Thursday through Saturday for that estate sale at the Old Nance. Bible study has been moved from the 23rd to the 30th, so keep that in mind. It's not on the 23rd anymore. It'll be on the 30th at 6.30. So it's moved one week ahead. One week ahead. Or forward. However you want to read that. And notice that the uh, choir will be singing with the Homer High School Choir on the, at their concert on 7 o'clock on the 22nd, which is a Wednesday, and that will be here. So keep that in mind. And finally, uh, a welcome and a blessing in our prayers to all mothers today, whether and I would like to say all mothers spiritual and physical. So uh, welcome to all of you who have served in those that role in many different ways. Do we have any other announcements in the life of the church? Seeing none, we'll begin with a reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Actually, it's 15, 9 through 11. I wonder I couldn't find it. Jesus says here, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made complete. Please join me in the prayer of preparation. Lord and one true God, be among us today. By your Spirit, may the love of Jesus Christ abide among us and in us. And by your Spirit, may we abide in your love through Jesus the Christ this day and every day. We ask it in his name. Amen. And we'll stand for the call to worship, which has been adapted today from Psalm 1. Blessed are the ones who don't follow wicked advice or take their part with God scoffers or walk down paths that lead to wrong. Rather, blessed are ones who consider what God tells them and makes it their aim each day and night to be guided by those words. For God's guidance makes those led by it into green trees planted by water, yielding good fruit in its season, prospering in the work God gives them to do. Not so the wicked. Those who ignore God will be like chaff blown away by the wind. They will not endure, will not stand in the company of the righteous. But the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. The Lord watches over those who abide in his word and love. And we'll join in our opening hymn on page 562, Be Thou My Vision. may be seated. One other note just to remind you, you'd have the br brunch for Mother's Day after the service today, and if you did not already, and mothers here, pick up a carnation on your way in, then grab one on your way out if you didn't. Please join with me now in the prayer of confession as it's printed in our bulletin. Our one true God of grace, you have given us your guidance in the laws of Moses and in the teaching of Jesus. In Jesus and by his cross, you opened the way for us to be forgiven of the wrong we have done and to live new lives in the image of Jesus, freed from guilt and the fear of death. And by sending us your Holy Spirit, you have made the possibility of such lives a reality. And yet, Lord, we confess that the old ways of sin and death still have a strong pull on us. 
At times we still glance longingly toward the ways of the wicked, the path of the uncaring. Rather than considering your words and your way for us day and night, we waste our attention on the unbelief of the scoffer. Lord, one true God of grace, pull us back from the edge of disaster and forgive our drifting. Let your vision become ours and your Christ our true word. Plant us in your living water and let us grow and abide in the fertile soil of your love. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll take a moment of confession in our own hearts. The way of the wicked will perish. They will blow away like chaff. But in Jesus Christ, by God's grace, we may grow tall and endure in God's love. We are forgiven, replanted by abundant streams of living water. Praise be to God. Please pass the Christ, peace of Christ to one another. Please bow with me now for the prayer of illumination. Lord, instruct us by your words, teach us by the Holy Spirit, and help us to ponder them and meditate on them day and night. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our second reading is from the opening of the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10a. This is usually considered the, the uh, call story of Jeremiah the prophet. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, 
to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of King Josiah, king of Ammon of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It also came in the days of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, son of Josiah of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. <clears throat> now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And this time with any young disciples, please come forward. You can have a seat. You can sit down if you want. I have to show you a picture, though. This is my cat. Every morning, if I don't get up in the appropriate time to feed him, he uh, sees to it. He comes up on the bed and starts going out. This cat, by the way, I think it must be part Siamese because it's got a really high nasally meow. And so he gets up on the bed and goes and it's time to get up. That's what he is. Now, he is trying to get me to do what he wants me to do, which is feed him. Um, I have a choice, of course. I can keep sleeping or I can get up and feed him. Eventually, he will shut up if I just lay there really quiet. But he'll come back again. He'll start up again. As soon as he sees me move, he'll begin again. Now, there's all kinds of people who help us decide what to do in life, right? What are some of them? Yeah, okay, we're celebrating your mom's today, your mom today. This is Mother's Day, so this is, those are some of the people, the important ones that help us decide what to do in life uh, by giving us their instructions, their thoughts. But do you have to go along with them? No. You may think right now you do, but eventually, you, and you should, you always should, but you have a choice. You know, if your mom says, hey, don't go grab that electrical cord, you have a choice. You can go out and grab it. I said, if I, I tell a lot of people, I just say, don't pet this cat on his hind side because he doesn't like it. And some people still go ahead and do it, and they get, they get scratched or bitten. Uh, he doesn't like that. So you can listen to the people who help to guide you, like your mom, your dad, but you have a choice which way to go. If you're smart, of course, you listen when, when people know what their talent can say to you. But we also, of course, the, the real, the one that we really have to listen to is God. That's what we just heard in the story about Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah, God came and said, Jeremiah, I'm going to send you. I've known you since you were a little baby in your mother's stomach. Way back then, I knew who you were. And I want you to do some special work for me. And Jeremiah says, I don't think I can do it. I'm, I don't know enough. But God said, oh, believe me, I'll be with you. Now, Jeremiah could have chosen not to. But he didn't. He became a prophet, and he followed God's will. And that was a good thing. It was a smart thing for him to do. So this is just something to remind us. We're always to listen to those who try to help us make our way through life because it's a smart thing to do. It will help us get the best we can out of life, whether that guidance comes from teachers or your mom and dad or whoever. But especially when we want to think about God. But we want to think about God's guidance. 
And today, for Carissa, you are going into a milestone in your life coming up here. You'll be going into fourth grade. Now, that doesn't maybe not seem like much. You Most people think, well, I'll be in sixth grade, I go to junior high school, and then I go to high school. But in fourth grade, there is a difference. There is a difference. You're making more decisions. You're thinking about more serious things. And so we give these Bibles out as you go into fourth grade. Because what's in here will help you guide it. It'll help you figure out your way as you go and help you make decisions. So as you go, Carissa, we hope you read that Bible and let it help you with decisions. We're going to have a prayer, and then Porter's going to pray and play for us. Lord, we thank you today for mothers and fathers and for all those who you give wisdom to to help us go the right way in life. Help us especially to follow you. We ask you to bless these two and keep them in your love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming up. Then you want to hang out there for a minute. final reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. Again, listen for the word of the Lord to us in this. This takes place before Pentecost, but after the ascension of Jesus. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers together. The crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. This became known to the residents of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their language Hakodama, that is, the field of blood. For it is written, in the, as it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead become desolate and let there be no one to live in it. And let, us, let another take his position of overseer. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all that time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. 
Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you've chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own way, to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. So the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in the sight of God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Scripture is full of descriptions of the difference that are, occur between lives, one person's life as opposed to another. The differences that take, taken together govern the way those lives end up. Psalm 1, the source of our call to worship today, is an excellent example of that. Many scholars of the Psalter believe that Psalm 1 was written on purpose to begin the book because of particular instructions it gives to advise the reader on one key difference that determines how well the book will be read in the right way. The way we approach the Psalms, the writer instructs, the way we approach any scripture for that matter, makes a big difference. If we do so with a skeptic's eye in mind, with the attitude that we just as soon go our own way rather than God's way, then we're not going to get much out of reading any scripture. But conversely, if we read the Psalter with the Spirit's guidance and with the mind and ear of one who really wants to hear and consider deeply God's guidance, who values it, then it will bear fruit. And it will allow it to prosper in the work, allow us to prosper in the work God gives us to do. And this is not just the case in reading Scripture. It occurs in all of our living. It makes a huge difference who we are, how we think about life, and how we decide what guides our life. Now, to tell the truth, almost every story about any person in Scripture is one about differences, of where that person starts out and where that person ends up, and what makes the difference in that journey. Such is the case in the opening chapter of Jeremiah, often thought of as the call story of the prophet. But if we read it as a call story in which the prophet is summoned by God to a certain task, we might want to examine the account to see what differences there are, how, how Jeremiah changes to enable him to follow that calling. Jeremiah begins his story as a priest in, the fam in a family of priests. But he is called by God in the opening chapter of his book to become something different, one who doesn't just see to the ongoing worship of the people, but who will be a prophet, who will bring them God's new word. And at first, as in the case of almost all the biblical call stories, Jeremiah resists. He can't do it, he says. He's not sufficiently experienced. I am only a boy, he protests. Now, we shouldn't assume he is really only a boy, a young, just a child. But he's saying, I, I don't know enough to do this. I'm not experienced enough. But God, who has apparently had his sights on Jeremiah for a long time, when I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you, knows more about Jeremiah than Jeremiah does about what the boy can really do, about what God will make, how that God will make that boy into God's man. And God tells Jeremiah exactly what will make the difference. Don't say, I am just a boy, God commands, for I will be with you, and I will put my words in your mouth. This is what makes the change. The difference in Jeremiah, which will send his life on a whole new trajectory, one that he at some points may reject. He is called the sorrowful prophet indeed, but one which is vital to his people. God's word comes into him. It becomes a force in him that he will later call a burning in my bones. And this, along with God's abiding presence and grace, leading and surrounding him, will enable Jeremiah to do what he could not have done before to bring his people a needed word of judgment, to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy and overthrow, but also a needed word of healing, the balm and Gilead from God to build and to plant. This is what made the difference in the life of Jeremiah, and in some ways if it's almost exactly the same thing that makes a difference between two of the disciples, Judas and Peter. 
Now we find Peter in our reading from Acts this morning with the pre-Pentecost intention of filling the gap in the ranks of the twelve that the defection of Judas has left. Now it may seem odd to us that Peter thinks that this numerical specific is so important that he has to waste his time picking another one to fill out the twelve, but we have to remember keep it in mind that the number of apostles, the number 12, is not just a coincidence. It was quite possibly intended by Jesus to represent a new and a remade 12 tribes of Israel. So Peter believes before the work goes on after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, this hole left by Judas must be filled. We have to have our 12 made whole again. Now, it's worth pondering the difference between Peter and Judas, as they're both presented in this passage, although it may seem obvious to us. As he had been before the crucifixion, Peter is pretty much the leader of the apostles. For now, at least, he's the leader of all the disciples of Jesus that are gathered there that day. Some 120, the text tells us. Notice again, it's a multiple of 12. Peter is the rock. That's what Jesus had named him, Peter. Peter, remember, is not his name. Peter is a nickname that Jesus gives him. Peter is the one through whom the first Gentiles we brought into the body of Christ. By contrast, Judas is the villain of the story. Judas is the one who became a guide for the ones who arrested Jesus. He had been numbered among the apostles, trusted by Jesus, but had turned away, lured by something, whether a paltry amount of silver or something more, we will never really know. And after his betrayal, he had bought a field with his reward, according to Luke, and there died, perhaps by his own hand, creating a need for a replacement. How could the difference between Peter and Judas be any more clear? But perhaps it's not that simple. In John 15, as part of his words to the disciples, which at that time, remember, included both Peter and Judas, Jesus told them what was necessary to be his followers. There were two things that Jesus mentions there. One was to follow his commandments, his teaching, his guidance, his way of living for God. The other thing, which is the thing that would enable the disciples to accomplish that first thing, the second was to abide in Jesus' love to live in it, to, to trust in it, to bathe in it, to believe in it and the grace that it brought. Without this abiding in Christ, there could be no obedience, and there could be no being like Christ. There could be no discipleship. But with it also came something else. There came joy, the joy of Jesus for his friends, the joy of his friends in Jesus and the life they had found. Now again, we need to remember that both Judas and Peter had once abided in that love. We also have to remember that at roughly the same time, they had both quit abiding it, leaving Jesus behind them and falling out of his joy. For Judas, we've heard the story recited by Peter in Acts, but at the same time that Judas was betraying Jesus, we can't forget that Peter had his own betrayal, too, that he ran. He denied Christ because he was afraid of being connected with Jesus. The fact is simply that this, that all the disciples deserted Jesus. They all ran out on him. By the witness of the gospel stories, there was only maybe one disciple at the cross. According to John, there was one there. The others stayed away at a safe distance. So what made the difference between how Peter ends up, and along with most of the other disciples, and how Judas ends up? And the only answer I can come up with, the only one I conceive of, is simply that Peter came back to Jesus, and Judas, for whatever reason, did not. I do not for a moment believe that Judas would have been rejected if he had, but would have been welcomed back into the love of Christ to abide there once more. Forgiven for a new start, just as it was with Peter. The difference is that one came back to abide and the other didn't. It's a sad commentary. 
One hopes that maybe Jesus, saving love, could reach out to Judas even after he had left to go to his own place. But it's a shame that we can't read about the gracious and glad reunion of Savior and saved in Scripture as we do of Jesus and Peter. Now, there is one final difference I want to consider this morning, and that's the one between Joseph Barsabbas, also called Justice, and Matthias. The two disciples in Acts who are selected as potential candidates to replace Judas and to complete the Twelve again. Now, we don't know anything about these two who were suggested to fill the position, except that both had accompanied the original Twelve, beginning with the baptism of John, up until the day Jesus was taken up. That was the requirement of experience imposed upon whoever would become Judas's replacement. This is, as far as I know, in this scripture, the first and the last time we hear of either one of them in scripture. And the only difference that we can really state in the fact between them is that Matthias was chosen to replace Judas by casting lots, an accepted method of making church decisions at that time, the chance assumed to be guided by Jesus who knew everyone's heart. Matthias was chosen. Now, what does this tell us about Matthias? Was he more faithful or more trusting, more pure in heart than justice? Does it mean there was something lacking about justice, something wrong with his heart? Not at all. We don't know what it means. It may have been just an equal choice between two people. Matthias I might even have been the lesser choice, and God said he needs a little encouragement. He needs a bump up, so let's make him the disciple. But we can assume, I think, I think, assume this. Both men and all of those other hundred or so that were gathered together, men and women, also disciples of Jesus, but who had not made that final cut, were able to go out from there to be able and faithful followers because they were all invited, all welcome to abide in Jesus' love. And when it came to that, there was no difference at all between any of them or any of us. Now, our names will probably never show up in a dictionary of, of Christian luminaries or a dictionary of Bible people, as does Peter's, and I suppose even Matthias's and Justice's. And hopefully none of us will ever become infamous like Judas. But like Peter and Matthias and Justice, and even like Judas, we are all invited to dwell and abide in the love of Christ and to go out guided by that love and faithful to obey Jesus' commandments to bear fruit, to bear witness, to live as followers. It will make a difference for us. And along with that, we are all invited and also all welcome to live in joy, to live in knowing the joy of the Christ has in us and the joy that we can have in him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll ask you to join our affirmation of faith. This has been adapted from Psalm 1. The psalmist tells us, Happy and blessed are they who meditate day and night on God's grace and guidance, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. We'll join now in a, a very old song, 564, just a closer walk with thee. Remember, it, the, each verse is followed by the chorus, so just keep that in mind as we sing through it.
So we go now to our time of prayer. We have ongoing concerns. We want to continue to remember Barb Baumgartner and uh, also Barbara, um, Tom and Mary Jo's da daughter. Uh, so both Barbaras. Do we have any others today? Holly? Prayer, prayers for Tom and Diane. They're headed south this morning. Traveling for Tom and Diane. Oh, Nelson. Heading out of town. Others? Then let us go to prayer. We'll end together with the Lord's Prayer. Lord, we thank you that you know our inmost thoughts. You know our inmost being. You know what we can do. And you will guide us to that way if we'll listen to you, if we will follow you, and if we will abide in your love. You will get us to where we both need to go, and you need us to go, and where we will be in our fullest joy, where we will be in our fullest life. We thank you for that, and we ask you to continue to let us con meditate and think on your guidance and on your love. Let your Holy Spirit guide us in all things. We pray today for both Barbaras uh, as they are in recovery, and as they look down the road toward other things, we ask you to be with them both, strengthen them both, give them your grace, and be with those who love them. We pray for traveling for Tom and Diane today. Uh, as they travel down south, they travel out. We ask you also to be with all who might be traveling this weekend and any who are traveling about or have whatever distance to keep them safe on the roads and to give them a blessed trip. In as they're making it. We pray today and we give you thanks for all those who are mothers, spiritual and, and emotional and physical. We ask you to be with each one that is still engaged in that task and strengthen them in it, lift them up in it, give them your guidance in it. We pray also for those for whom this day can sometimes be kind of sore, can sometimes be kind of hard when there were relationships that weren't as good as we had hoped they would be. We pray for them as well. And for all who are in the process of perhaps becoming mothers, we ask your grace and your, your help for them and your guidance for them. Lord, for all your people, we pray your guidance. For all your world, we pray for your guidance. We pray for your touch where there's heart, hurt, and, and the lack of peace and ask you to be there and ask your church to be there. Give us the strength to be who you want us to be. Help us to abide in your love and to live in your love, giving it out. And for this we pray and give you thanks in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'll ask that the offerings be brought forward for the blessing. Lord, you have sent us out into the world. Send also these offerings with your blessing into the world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And we'll conclude today with our final hymn on page 552, I am thine, O Lord.
the writer of this hymn, Fanny Crosby, and makes a true statement in that last, last line. And she says, there are depths of love and there are heights of joy that I won't really know until I pass the Jordan. But there are heights of joy and peace and rest that we can know now as we abide in Christ's love. Let us abide in it and go out in it. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with all of us now and forever. Amen.